They put me in a residential school when I was six years old. Forced me from my family and all I'd ever known. I cried out for my mama, but she could not hear me. I was two hundred miles away in Chupanacadie. Them see me cry. They held my head under water until I almost died. I can still hear screaming deep inside of me, and I will always bear the scars of Chupanacadie. My name is Lottie, and this was the name given to me. But I was born Indian, IRS 47. I was a number. I had this Christian name. I was born Indian. I had this Shubi number. But I also had another name. I'm Thunder Woman. That was my name. I left one residential school, and then I entered into a boarding school, a convent. And this, I was there for another three years. And then when I, instead of going home, um, I ended up getting a one-way ticket to Boston. I never felt like uh, I belonged anywhere. And I didn't like being Indian. From where we came from was the spirit world, a star. And it was like it, you were born into this world and through our parents and then you live this life on this earth. And through this, sometimes, somewhere, the, the connection was lost. So these children came back to wherever they're not fitting in, not belonging. Um, and they were stripped mostly of like their own identity, their own spirituality. And some of them came out quite heartless for a long time. That's how I felt, like I had no heart, I had nothing. But I, just this sadness. They used children as their pawns in this. It was like a, a, a Cold War, some kind of a psychological warfare that was going on, I found. And it was children that they used. The sickness that we brought back was physical and emotional, mental, spiritual. We came back with this. And we brought it back to our communities. We passed it on to our families, uh, community members, to our children. I couldn't protect myself. I couldn't protect my children. I was at a, a loss. And my husband was alcoholic, and I became alcoholic trying to catch up to him. I ended up placing my children for protective custody. So when I was married the second time, I says, I, I won't t tolerate none of this anymore. I ended up going to uh, AA, psychiatric uh, counseling. I was going to doctors. I had um, out-of-body experiences. All of these things were happening all at once. It wasn't like until after I left Boston, I came home, these same dreams and different visions were happening. I had nobody to talk to and nobody to guide me. And I didn't trust nobody. I couldn't tell nobody these things because everything kind of related back to the residential school. And when I, even then, there were things I was told and I was shown, and I knew things before they happened. So in the residential school, I learned to keep quiet about it. One of the girls told the nun that I was a witch because of this or something like that. I don't know how kids are, but they says, oh, she, she knows these things. She's a witch. The nun, that was Sister Roberta, she sent me to the church to pray. She told me I was an evil, wicked child. I was going to burn in hell. <laughs> what I think I was lacking or missing was like a spiritual guide. It's good to have social workers and uh, all of these other people, but a lot of them, unless they're native, don't seem to understand what our people are going through. Part of my job, I go into the schools uh, working with the residential school survivors and that. I try not to get into too much of 
my story or the physical or whatever abuses. I just present the facts that are there. So I t talked a little bit about uh, the beatings, being locked up or whatever happened. This kid says, boy, he says, I would beat them up. And he says, I would run away. You know, and he says, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you beat them up? Why didn't you go home? When I was there, the nun used to tell me, you're here because nobody wants you. So I thought of like, if I run away, where am I going to go? They're only going to bring me back. They're going to beat me. They're going to cut my, shave my head or whatever. And I remember my sister ran away. And I was in the kitchen when they told me she ran away. I went after her. And this was like, uh, instead of coming in after for supper, they ran over the hill. So I ran down the hill and I dragged her back. They brought in those other three girls that night. And these girls were beaten. They had their head shaves. But I said, uh, you know, where are you going to run to? For those that survived the alcohol, the drugs, and all of these things, the, the big cities or wherever they went to, the ones that s survived came back. I don't exactly see them as survivors, but they have a story to tell. These are like messengers to our people. Our people need to know, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you beat them up? Why didn't you go home? And he says, I would run away. Unfortunately, the thing about trauma is that <laughs> Resistance is usually met with more power, more force, more threat, so that ultimately folks have to yield, which is the ultimate goal, to have them give in and go along. That's how oppression does its work. It, it whittles away people's ability to resist. And it was children that they used. Children coming into the schools as good knees, they were abuse where they became bad me's and then they left feeling not me. You take away from a child through abuse that sense of future. What else do we expect from them when they go back into that world? Language was gone. Ceremony was gone. Clothing was gone. Everything about them that, I, that struck with the identity of being Aboriginal was gone. We need to go back to our ceremonies. We need to go into our sweat lodges, our sun dances, our weepy. We need to go back to our language. And I guess we got to turn back to our, to Mother Earth and to nature for some of the answers and to our sacredness. I think I would say like I'm, I'm a typical survivor. I received abuse as a child, so like eventually I probably learned that it was a norm. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't all that bad. Like it was something that happened if you didn't listen. I was married, like, and I was in abusive situations. It's been happening all through my life, so, you know, like I just kind of accepted it. I would probably would have thought it was kind of like the norm. I felt I had to kind of um, push myself to, you know, to go and to see and, you know, to learn, try to understand what was going on. And that was my way. Other people going through their healing journey, I guess it would have to be like a lot of supports and some people they know, and especially people of their own culture. That's much easier because... Um, it's not the same when when you do your counseling with non-native when when you have experienced all this stuff from non-natives so you feel more at ease or better being counseled or you know talking to your own Mi'kmaq people there is no support in our first nation it's sad to say, but there's no support there. With outside organizations, it's been it's been happening, like with uh, APC putting on their workshops and stuff. Just being a part of it even makes a difference, because I learn as as we go along, and I start to understand more. When they start to talk about things or make their presentations, then then it starts to click in, like yeah. That's what's been happening, and now I understand it a little bit more. I know, like, with my kids, I, I never really said anything and until, like, kind of recently, and I only told them, like, bits 
little bits of it, like some of the abuse. I know now that it, it has had a lot of impacts. It has impacted my children because I stayed in a relationship with my husband that wasn't healthy. The kids seen and heard things that weren't healthy. I think, though, that they, they've learned a lot now that I'm hoping that, you know, it doesn't pass on to the next generation. Generations later, we're now dealing with youth, right? And we're saying to ourselves, why such awful problems? This is a better life right now for them than their grandparents had or their great-grandparents had. In many ways, there's, things have eased up some. Why are they showing these horrific problems? When I look at a youth today as, as, a, as an elder, I can quickly identify why that little person is feeling so lost. They don't understand why they're feeling so sad. I deal with these children in sweat lodge. I deal with these children in Sundance. I deal with these children in therapy, that they're so dislocated, disoriented. They don't belong. So I would take that young person and I would give them a history lesson. But our side of the story, and quickly they understand and they'll say, thank you, we, I've never, nobody's ever sat me down and, and gave me the only perspective of where I came from or why I have grief. It's been happening all through my life, so, you know, like I just kind of accepted it. I would, probably would have thought it was kind of like the norm. We learn from the men that women are cattle. Don't respect your women. Don't respect your mother. You are a man. They are your servants. In our way of thinking, women were held in high esteem. They were the givers of life. They were our mothers. They were the people who taught that kindness that we as men need to learn. We lost that because the patriarchal system says, you're a man. You run everything. You don't have to listen to the women. So we lost that. It's time to go back to the strength of the woman. It's not the same when when you do your counseling with non-native. There's a lot of teachings that the non-natives have that are good, and their psychology or other psychology is good. But I interpret the way native people would understand it. <coughs> I break it down so that it can relate to it. Psychologists are good for some people, but native psychology is more related to who they are as native people. I remember we went to one meeting and said, and we had one of the, uh, I don't know, therapists or something. Can you do something for this guy? I said, for, for him? I don't know if I can do anything, but he can probably do something for himself. But the best thing for me to do is not to crowd him, have respect for him, give the person their space and the time. When I started to help, like Lawrence said, you know, all I had was my ears and I was able, I had patience to listen. That's what I had. And, uh, you know, um, to me, when someone is there to listen, someone is there to share half of your load. And as long as they're talking, they're talking, they're bringing it out, and when they finish talking, it's there. It's not inside of them. It's here and what they want to do about it. I started my healing journey when I started uh, tending fire. Um, the sacred fire, I started tending. I had lost the ability to know how to pray or want to pray because of, uh, because of my alcoholism, because of my drug addiction. I was tired of drinking. I was, I was tired of the way I was doing things in life. I wanted a better way, a better way to uh, be able to reach out spiritually. Every time the, the fire was, it seemed like it was pulling me, that I, that I had to be there. And the more I listened to people pray, my life started to, to alter at that fire. 
I could tell you a little bit about what happened uh, when I was younger, even coming from um, uh, a dysfunctional family, having to run away all the time because of the beatings and watching my father abuse my mother. Even in the residential school, and even in there, I ran. I ran away a couple of times. The little child in me was always run. That was my answer. Could it get away from pain? Get away from ugly events in my life. Being put on parole, even running away when you're on parole. And when I decided, okay, this is it. There was no more running. Now I have to take that little inner child of mine and, and, and baby it. And that's that was my solution to baby baby that little inner child of mine. You know, and say, well. See the light. There's there's more to life than running. Today, I realized that wow, you know, like I could easily forgive my father, but then again, I would say I will never forget. Mm -hmm. I could forgive him and understand him a lot more because of that residential school experience. He was also abused as a child when he went to the residential school. So in some ways I'm I'm breaking that cycle. Maybe I'm I'm glad that now I don't I'm not a parent. I haven't had somebody come up and say, Hi Dad. Maybe I'm I'm breaking that cycle. There have been people that have come to the Sacred Fire. Uh, there's people that have been sexually abused, uh, people that I've talked with when when we were alone. And they open up to me. It takes an alcoholic to help an, an, an alcoholic, or an addict to help another addict. Or I look at it in this context: if if a survivor can help another survivor, I think that's the answer, and I think that's a key thing. That we don't have to go to a psychologist, we don't have to go see psychiatrists. We have one another. Wrote in a bush out in the open and out with nature, and here we are having a lunch. And we're therapeutic to each other. And um, it works for us. Both my parents went to residential school. <clears throat> They haven't told us much growing up. I just know that they, they hated priests and nuns. They told me that uh, priests should never be trusted. And the same as nuns, they should never be trusted. And they never really told us we were, they were in uh, residential school. We never heard any stories or just knew the hate. When they came out of Shibby School, they had us right away. We were... Uh, Exposed to like alcoholism, um, family violence, um, everything. What they learned in there, I believe, was uh, like violence and <clears throat> hate, abuse. They brought it home and they taught it to us. One day I was um, fed up with my parents drinking every day, day in, day out come home from lunch one day after being up all night <clears throat> refereeing and crying, counting, you know, so many mornings looking out the window after being up all night, watching the sun come up and still awake. I came home from school, lunchtime. My father's still drunk at the table. My mother's standing there and she hit me. She slapped my face so hard I could feel the sting for about a week. Out the door I went. I ran up the hill. We went to that. I went to that spot where uh, <clears throat> we all hung out. I grabbed that Tarzan rope and I wrapped it around my neck. I just stood there crying with that rope around my neck. And then finally, I just took it off and I just like walked down. And that afternoon, I went to school and I went to the guidance counselor and I told her, "Help me out here before I kill myself." I was just starting to pop pills. I was sniffing. I was drinking, and I was smoking up. 
doing everything. If I didn't go counseling, I probably wouldn't have even finished a year. But I, I went into counseling and I wanted to get out of there. So that's what I did. I, I graduated, from, graduated from grade nine, went to high school. But when I got to high school, I would say I was already a uh, um, probably chronic alcoholic, 15 years old, grabbing their white girls and just pinning up against, against the wall, just, you know, not really fighting, but just letting them know not to mess with me because, you know, after all I've been through all my life. Finally, I, uh, I sobered up because I started having kids, and I said, I'll be damned if I'm going to put my kids through what I've been through. So I sobered up. I started working at rehab. I was a Natica worker. After that, I went and worked at a transition house. I found myself going into like a work where, where I could protect children and protect women. And then after I left transition house, I started working at Sony Mental Health as a, mental, a female mental health worker. I worked with women who were uh, abused and children. I ended up um, resigning from that job. I was out of work for about eight months when I got this job. It was kind of like what I was looking for. It was like that missing piece. And then when I started going to workshops and conferences and then learning more about Shubi School and learning di the, the di dynamics of how we were raised, a lot of light bulb moments, you know? Like, oh my God, that's why. Oh my God, and that's why. It's like a lot of that for probably the first year. And then here I am. I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And uh, that impacted me, how I raised my kids. You know what I mean? It's like um, my kids weren't exposed to that. I knew growing up at a young age even that what, what was happening in our own family was wrong. And feeling it, though, later in life, like, especially when I had my own kids, it was like, um, geez, I'm going to turn this around. I had this baby, just loving this baby to death, you know, smelling it, kissing it, you know, playing with it, giving it everything I had, 100% right into this child, up until they were 12. Why 12? I don't know. Maybe 12 is the magic number, because that's when I stopped my abuse. Um, it was like, um, okay, that's enough. You don't need any more affection. And another kid coming along, same thing. Boom, boom, boom. Give them all the love and affection. Right up until about 11 or 12. Stop. Not even to, like, even to help the boys take a shower. I mean, wash their back or, you know. No, I mean, you're, you're this age now. I don't want to. You should be doing that on your own. Just like a lot of boundaries I wouldn't even dare cross. Probably because there was no boundaries for me growing up. Nobody respected my boundaries. I, you know, I probably didn't respect anybody's. But that was like, like I said, it's a learned behavior. Like that's the only thing that's saving me, saving my mind from losing it. Is I just keep telling myself that's a learned behavior. My parents learned that from somebody. And they were raised by priests and nuns. They brought it home and they taught it to us. First we seen the survivors and we thought we seen it all. But the descendants, I feel, carry more pain. I, I really don't like to measure the pain level. Because pain is pain. But you have their parents or grandparents that have gone to residential school. And you have these descendants that don't understand why they think, feel, behave a certain way. It's really unfair for them to be born in that situation. And it's not any fault of their own parents. It's a system that they've been engaged in. So it's difficult for a child to be born in that, and that should be rage. Because rage is rage, but should be rage is something more. I just stood there crying with that rope around my neck. Trauma is something so powerful that it goes to the very core 
of where humans are held together. It goes to their animus, the Greek word for spirit. It goes to their soul, if you would. And when it does that, it shakes that soul. It shakes the spirit. It loosens its ability to hold and balance all those other parts. And when that happens, the parts can no longer stay healthy and they can't communicate with each other. The child who grows up in different circumstances where maybe through no fault of their own, families are involved in their own survival. Families have their own needs and their own issues. The child is sort of just an afterthought and no one's really noticing as that child goes through their needs. And so the child gets neglected. The child's needs are not important so that if they start infringing on the needs of the adult, the child can even get punished for that and even abused, as we know. We need to talk about the bad things. They need to know what happened to our parents and why it happened. It's not all their fault. We should talk to each other and, and, and see where we can put the positives because we survived this too. I didn't totally understand uh, growing up uh, why my father was so angry. We grew up in a violent, dysfunctional, alcoholic home. I was always angry at him. And I think I was always so angry at him because he was so angry and I didn't know what to do to help him. He was just so mad and I never understood what could have been so bad in my father's life for him to be so angry and take it out on his family. It wasn't until I got involved with the issue that it really started to make me think. Of course, when you're going throughout the whole Atlantic, providing outreach to Indian residential school survivors, descendants, communities, giving updates to leadership, lobbying at the national level as much as you can. It wasn't actually something I was prepared to hear at home. I held an outreach session on any residential school with a member of the government, a regional health support worker, and other former students who lived in Indian Island. And my father always supported my meetings. I didn't care what it was. If I had a meeting, he made sure he was there. When we were sitting there talking about the issue, my father finally disclosed what I've never heard him talk about ever in my life. The two of us sitting there, side by side, crying. And it was like my life really changed that day. We finally talked about it. Something I never understood my whole life. It changed me when he talked. And I can now forgive my dad. I'm 30 years old. And it took me that long to finally forgive my father. And I could finally learn to forgive myself for being angry with him. Everything that my parents taught me is who I am today. And they did the best they could. Who do you really get mad at? Do you get mad at your parents? Or do you get mad at a system that caused so much harm to our people? And you get mad at the system. I'm no longer angry with my father. I don't want my father to die. I don't want anything to happen to my father. Even when my father, if something happened now where there was a disagreement, I would never fly off the handle like I used to and be all pissed off and mad at him. I don't want to be angry. I don't want, uh, I don't want ever though to lose focus during this whole time of the issue of what it's really about. And 
it is um it is about healing and reconciliation it's about truth what i would like to tell their descendants is that you're not the only one who feels that hurt inside or or the pain and how you're trying to understand there are other descendants out there who feel that same way and all i could say is that i was just lucky enough to actually have had that talk with my father about his experiences i love him that i love him so much more after that day him and i sat there so to be a descendant of my father has made me tougher and has actually made me uh, more humble and more forgiving. We finally talked about it. What happened in Canada? It needs to be told. It needs to be talked about. Healing is going on to different degrees in different communities. And it seems to start where people somehow break the silence. What loss and trauma cries for is not to be fixed or explained, because we can explain it all we want. But I think it needs to be shared and to find its way to meaning. Our children will fly again. We will tell them the truth. My father came from that school, lived in a dysfunctional, angry household, alcohol, was a big, downfall for our family. My mom ended her life. Three years later, my dad did. Five, year, five years later, my sister did. So when did my healing take place or start? Is when I think when I um, finally asked what was Ruby. So to me, that's probably where my healing started. But I'm still like, I don't even feel like I'm not even halfway there yet. It's just really trying to stop being angry at my dad is, is where I'm still stuck. I'm happy to help those that I can help, but it's, it's that hard to do that in a reflection. Eh? You, I go to the mirror and say, you're good, you're strong, you've gone this far. And, and then, you, I don't know, it just seems like sometimes I'm, no one's there when I'm talking to myself in the mirror. I just see my dad being, an angry dad. Yeah. Even though that he's not here, I still feel like I'm a victim. And I pray and I, God knows how much I try not to follow the old um, dysfunction. But I catch myself, but I apologize and I try to make things right. But still, like, because there was no resources, there was no support, there were nobody to tell me it's all right when you fall apart. I don't know how it became, but I end up putting all my brothers and sisters together and just kind of, they were the, they were the core. They're the ones that helped me through. We all help each other through. And I'm so grateful for that. I went back to church too. I, cause I, the church has always been a big part of our family life. So I left that for a while, but I went back, walked, meditate, talk, um, reconnect with old family and friends. And I stopped beating myself up. And that felt good to stop doing that. There's really still not a, a lot of people that know what Shubi was or is. As soon as you mention Shubi, oh, they're, they're survivors. That's all they know. They don't understand what the residential school meant and what did it did to them. The descendants know what happened to them or are, are starting to understand what happened and um, still have a whole lot of understanding to do because they haven't told all their stories yet. And for us descendants to try to tell the community or even your extended family what happened to them, there's still not a lot of awareness or education or understanding. So really, as a descendant, I'm hurt, angry, and I still feel victimized by the survivor, even though he's not with us here today. I'm still hurt and angry, but I still yet understand where he came from, why he is the way he was, and why he did the things he did. Um, I don't know. Uh, I always pray and 
try to convince myself that I forgive him, but I can't forget. The word that I've incorporated into my healing is reconciling. And reconciling is about learning somehow to live with. You can still carry the scars of the past, but you can stand up and say, you know, I carry the scars, but I'm more than I'm a warrior that will continue on living and doing what I have to do in order to be a great Native person. I think I'd like to speak from mom's perspective first. It's not my story, it's hers, and it's the rest of the survivors. What I would like to tell them, and this is coming from my mom's perspective and her truth, that the story is true, and um, it's a reality of thousands of children who were incarcerated at the um, Indian Residential School at no fault of their own. What the survivors dealt with at the school, what they were subjected to, they brought into their own family um, lives, into their homes. When she left the school, like I said, she had um, her first child at 17. She married very young, um, lost her uh, native rights. She went back to school. She educated herself. She wasn't letting everything that she lost stand in the way of her future. She never spoke about, you know, everything. Um, we would often hear her, like, crying through her sleep. I would hear her sobbing. And then, you know, she started to share what happened at the school, the nightmares that resulted from this school. She took us to the school, and we went through the building. She explained everything. I guess it was to educate us, to bring awareness, as to why she was the way she was. 1986, she started collecting names of former students of the Shivanagini Indian Residential School. Mom started the organization um, after collecting, and then uh, the organization formed in 1995, September 22nd, 1995. And at that time, she had 900 plus survivors. Um, 2007, there was a little over 600, and today there's a little over five. I worked alongside of Mom for many, many years with the survivors. We would travel to these meetings, and it was down in Eskasoni. There was some descendants in there also that were sharing. And uh, my mom was looking at them, and that's when she apologized. And it was like, wow, because she was in denial for so many years about the abuse, the abuse from, you know, um, extended families to her children. Um, and we were very angry with her for a lot of years because we didn't understand. All the losses that they suffered, we too have suffered those losses. The mental, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, we too as descendants. Not all, but some of us have suffered that at the hands of our parents, you know, or uncles or aunts. I wish things like that didn't happen, but they did, and they made me the person I am today. She wrote a poem, and it's, um, it's called A Person's Journey. And in that poem, she, and that's what she says, it's okay to linger for a while, but to, to move forward. Learn about the residential school, you know. Learn about what they went through. Try to have some kind of understanding and compassion of what they lost. So we can also take a stand against the injustice for our people, you know. And hopefully this never ever happens again. The government needs to realize, though, that uh, with the apology, June 11th, the apology was beautiful. But we need action. We need action with those words, the survivors, the descendants, and our children to come. Because it doesn't just stop with my generation. It continues on. I have children. I have grandchildren, you know, and I'm sure the dysfunction has hit them also. We need to deal with that. When the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement was signed in September 2007, APC went out and informed survivors 
About the settlement agreement itself, the five components of the settlement agreement are the common experience payment, the independent assessment process, Truth and Reconciliation Canada, healing, health, and commemoration. Most of the people have already gotten their common experience payment. There is an adjudication secretariat that was developed from Indian Northern Affairs, but it's an independent body and it's looking at the um, independent assessment process and that's compensation to the survivors for extreme physical, sexual and emotional abuse. The adjudication process is one where the survivor puts in an application, states what abuses they suffered while they were in Indian residential school and the impacts of those abuses and they go to an uh, alternative dispute resolution hearing. There's also um, the healing component which was the Aboriginal Healing Foundation and the health component which was the Resolution Health Support Program. They have the RHSWs which are the Resolution Health Support Workers and Cultural Support Persons that ha assist survivors with this whole settlement agreement. As they go through their CEP claims, their independent assessment claims, go through the TRC, they're with them at every step. They're with them before things happen, during it, and afterwards. Most times the um, survivors ask for us to be there to pray with them before they give their IAP, before they give their story. So what I do, as an elder, I go there and I pray and I smudge them down. And uh, then I leave as they give their story. And then they call me when they're finished. And then I go over there again and I pray with them. And then I brush them down with my ego fan. You know, brush away all the negativity that that, that has gone through. And uh, they tell me that when they finish, they tell me that, you have helped me so much, you know, going through this, because it's hard for them. Being the Resolution Health Support Worker is, you know, in the stories, knowing the process. And I just wish I could just help them and help them uh, more. And then when we get into the story, when the lawyer talks about it and asks some questions, and you can see, boy, you can see the pain come out. Some of them are ready, some of them are not. They want to do it, they're scared to do it. And then after that, uh, when they go through the process, the IAP hearing and that, you can see their face, their, that lifting from their face, you can see that happening to them, that they did it. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission is a body that's been mandated to find out what was the truth. And that commission was started to uh, go out to the communities, go out and speak to survivors to find out what the truth, what the experience was from these Indian residential schools. What happened there? What were the impacts from it? How can we heal from this experience? Or even start the basis of reconciliation between the general public of Canada and Indian residential school survivors and their descendants. What we hope to accomplish is to acknowledge what has happened. What was Indian Residential School? What was the pain and the suffering that happened there? And we want to also acknowledge as Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy people that we've survived this. We've had a lot of pain and suffering and damages done to our communities and they tried to take our languages they try to take our culture, they try to um, harm our families, but ultimately we're here and we're rebuilding and we want to celebrate our culture and who we are and stand with pride and dignity. They put me in a residential school when I was six years old. Forced me from my family and all I'd ever known I cried out for my mama, but she could not hear me I was two hundred miles away in Chupanacadie 